Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. It's a beautiful summer, stormy day outside. And God's presence is everywhere. And so today, there's a topic that I want to talk to you about that I sort of puzzled a little bit over as to why God wants it spoken, but I've learned that I don't question what God wants. I just make myself available. And so I pray that I will allow him to speak freely through me and that we all will allow the Holy Spirit to cause us to hear what it is, what it is that God desires us to hear today. I want to tell you, people, in this hour, it is very important that you understand that it's tempting if you're not walking where you need to with God, not in perfection, but walking towards perfection, desiring Him and His truths. If you're not walking there, then it's going to be very tempting for you to heap to yourselves teachers who will teach you what your soul longs to hear. So if your soul is not dedicated to the Lord, I was reading in my Bible study today in the book of Luke chapter 14, that says something in this afternoon I've been faced with this truth that God is God and he will say what is what it is that he wants to say clearly and 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 it doesn't matter what we think or feel but when he says something even though it might shock us, we need to listen because he doesn't say it for the sake of saying it. So as I read in Luke 14 today, Jesus said, except you hate mother and father and wife and husband and children and yourself, unless you hate everything, and follow me, pick up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy to follow me. And that's a very shocking statement. And it bears thinking about because we can't dwell surface on the truths of God, neither can we dismiss them. But in the midst of that shocking statement, I know that when God speaks, we need to listen. And because of the hour that we live in, when people, just to get numbers and just to get resources and just to get power and just to get soulish satisfaction, it is easy to speak from our souls instead of from the spirit of the living God. And we're in the hour when we have to decide which way we will go, whether we will go with our flesh, go with the world, go with our culture, go with what Satan says, or whether we will go with what thus says the Lord in his word as revealed by his Holy Spirit, who is fully God. And so today, today's message is chosen by God. And so we need to listen. And no, I'm not setting myself up as someone so powerful or important. No, I'm coming to you 
humbly knowing the hour that we live in when it's so easy to step across a line for self-gratification. And so today, my people, my beloved brothers and sisters, let the title of my message begin to speak to your heart as the Holy Spirit speaks through me. And so the title of our message today is a scripture, and it's this, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, says the Lord. The Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And I want you to know that what you think, what you express, how you live, doesn't just affect you. It affects your posterity, those who come after you, those who surround you. It affects them. One day, I remember years ago, as my daughter and I were doing Bible study, I think she had just started college or was finishing up high school, and she says, Mom, oh my gosh, it just dawned on me. Everything that I do will affect who comes after me. Everything that we do, everything that we think, the way that we live. And so Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me, seeing that you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. And God is speaking to you and to me. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. And so today, God wants us to be equipped with a piece of knowledge. And we need to realize that whatever knowledge that we have will affect our children. In Exodus 4, 22, God himself says, as he's speaking to Moses to go before Pharaoh, he made this statement, Exodus 4, 22, you shall say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And that's the first point that I want you to hold on to today and dwell on because this is what God wants us to dwell on tonight, today. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I want to make a disclaimer as I bring this message today. I'm just touching on the surface of the scriptures on this topic. And so I am praying and I have prayed that the Holy Spirit helps me deliver His message and that the Holy Spirit gives you and I the grace to hear this message, not just with our ears, but with the understanding of our hearts. Amen? So let's start by hearing what the apostle of the Gentiles, the non-Jews, said about this topic. In Romans 11, Paul, the apostle of the non-Jews, said, I say then, has God cast away his people? 
God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture said of Elias? And I'm going to pause here. And I want you to let the Spirit speak to you through his word, which is the character, the truth of who God is. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Verse 5 of Romans 11. Even so then, at this present time also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. There's a remnant. There's a remnant of God's people, the Jews and even the Gentiles. A remnant, a group of people. And if you look there, and I don't want to dwell on this part, but if you look there, in Romans 11, what Elisha asked God and what God responded, what Elisha said, I'm the only one that's left. I'm the only one, God, that's left that believe in you. And I guess he was living in a time when surrounding him were so many who were living for the enemy. There were so many who were doing their own thing, living their own way, that he felt alone. And so God said to him, no, you're not the only one. There are 7,000 who have not bowed their knees to Baal, nor kissed his mouth. And so there's a remnant. And I pray today that you will not only be a part of that remnant, but you'll continue through the Word of God, through fellowship with Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, be a part of that remnant. And pray that those that we love will also be a part of the remnant because time is running out. Verse 11 of Romans 11, I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. So because of Israel's fall away from God, I don't want to pause and let you know, God knew what he was doing. He knew when he chose a people out of Abraham. When Isaac came out of Abraham and Sarah, and Jacob came out of Isaac, and the 12 tribes came out of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, God knew that there was no way that they could live a holy life without help. He knew it. And so his plan, after a while, was for him to leave his heavenly throne to come to earth as one of us to save not only Israel, the ones that he chose, but also us non-Jews. So Israel, yes, fell away from being able to follow God's law. None of us can. None of us can. That's why we needed Jesus. And so we, the Gentiles, came in to salvation through Jesus to provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy. But remember, the first 12 disciples were Jews.
verse 12. Now, if the fall of Israel be the riches of the world and the diminishing of Israel, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. Think about it. How much more the fullness of Israel. When Israel comes into its fullness, how much more will that event enrich us? It will. It's approaching fast. The day for the fullness of Israel is approaching when all Israel will see the one they pierced, when all Israel will see their king and believe. There's coming a day when the entire world, Jews and Gentiles, will bow their knee to the Lord. At that point, it's too late. So I pray, as I walk through this message, that you are ready for that day. And that you see the importance of praying for your family, your friends, your loved ones to be ready for that day. Verse 13 of Romans 11. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles. So Paul was chosen by God to be an apostle, a Jew. He was a Jew. But he was chosen by God to be the apostle of the Gentiles, us, the unbelievers. So he's speaking here to us. And in verse 15, he says, For the casting away of Israel was the reconciling of the world. So then what should the receiving of Israel be? but life from the dead. I want you to see how important Israel is to us as Christians. It was God's plan from the beginning and too many of us stand against it. And when we stand against it, I see Acts 5 when the High priest told them, be careful that you might not be fighting against God. Verse 16 of Romans 11. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. So see Israel, they're the first fruit. They're the root. They are holy in God's eyes, even though on the whole they've turned away from God because they refuse to believe in Jesus. They're still his holy root. They're still his first fruit. Verse 17, if some of the branches be broken off and you, that's us, being the wild olive tree were grafted in, among them, and this is what I want you to hear, those who say that Israel was replaced by the church. Here, we're seeking the truth from the word of God itself. And it says, we, the wild olive tree, were grafted in to the root of Israel. They are partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, and we were grafted in through Jesus Christ. So what is God saying in verse 18 of Romans 11? Boast not against the branches. Boast not. But if you boast, you do not bear the root, but the root bear you. Listen, don't boast against the branches of the olive tree. But if you boast, remember, 
you, the Gentile, the non-Jew, do not bear the root. The root, which is Israel, bears us. Verse 19 of Romans 11. So say, this is what we need to say, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. The branches were broken off that we, the Gentiles, may be grafted in. And my, my aunt, where I lived as a child in Guyana, had a yard full of fruit trees. And so I'm acquainted with the idea of the graft where I will watch her take a branch from a tree that might not be doing as well or that she wants to grow. And she will put a slit, a slanted slit on the bottom of that branch and then she will slit a branch of a tree that is fully alive and then she will take that branch that she wants to grow and she will attach the slant to the slant of that beautiful tree that is growing. Say for instance she wants these roses to grow. She will take the slant of that dead rose branch and she will graft it. She will put the two slants together and then she will wrap this plastic around the bottom and the top of those two pieces that are grafted. And of course she will water and do whatever she needs to do that tree that is alive. And very soon we will see that tree, say that mango tree bearing roses. <laughs> it's still bearing mangoes. How in the world does it know? That branch knows that it's, even though it's attached to a mango tree, it still knows to bear roses. It's God's DNA placed in that tree. So we, as the wild olive tree, were grafted in to the true olive tree, which is Israel, through Jesus Christ. Verse 20 of Romans 11. Well, because of unbelief, the branches of Israel were broken off. And you stand by faith, but be not high-minded, but fear. Understand who this God that we serve is. Because if he did not spare the natural branches, take heed lest. He also do not spare you. And I think it's important in this hour that we understand when so many are speaking against Israel, his firstborn, be sure, take heed that you are not adding your mouth where you don't understand the truth. Be armed with the truth. And remember, if God didn't spare the natural branches out of Abraham, whom he loved, out of Isaac and Jacob, whom he loved, out of those 12 sons of Jacob, whom he loved, if he didn't spare them, take heed, lest you also be not spared. Paul says in verse 22 of Romans 11, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, of those who fell, severity toward, to, to, toward them, but goodness toward you, if you continue in his goodness. Please underscore that. Goodness towards you, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall be also cut off. And I want to pause and address briefly those who says, once saved, always saved. The Bible begs to differ. And the Bible is the source of truth. It is the truth. It is God's truth. And it says right here, 
if we don't continue in his goodness, we too can be cut off. Verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue to abide in unbelief, shall be grafted back in, for God is able to graft them in again. There is coming a day when all Israel will be saved. For right now, the Gentiles are experiencing the salvation of God. But it says when the fullness of the Gentile comes, and I want to tell you on God's timetable, that's fast approaching. Once the fullness of the Gentiles come, then Israel will be pulled back in again. Verse 24 of Romans 11. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and you were grafted contrary to nature, think of that rose bush grafted on that mango tree, contrary against nature. If you were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, Israel, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? And so we see how we can just knock down that false theology that Israel is over and done with. They're going to be grafted back in again once the fullness of the Gentiles come. Verse 25 of Romans 11. For I would not, brethren, have you ignorant of this mystery. It's a mystery, but only to those who don't want to know. Because the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 29, 29 that the mysteries of God the secrets of God, when he reveals them to us, they are for us and for our children forever. So the mysteries of God are for us through the Holy Spirit if we desire to. So this is a mystery. But here in Romans 11.25, he's telling us he doesn't want us to be ignorant lest we be wise in our own conceit. And that's what I hear so many, even in my family, talking about Israel, in their wise in their own conceit. And it's so funny, briefly it came up this weekend on vacation about the Jews and how the, the, the monies that they receive and, and whatever, God didn't lay it on my heart to say anything, and thank God the conversation didn't go too far, and thank God it didn't go far out of line. But we've got to be careful with our own conceit. And it's so funny that I had this message already prepared before that conversation came up, because I prepared this last week before I went on my vacation the blindness happened to, listen to this, verse 25 of Romans, the blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, on the scoring, until the fullness of the Gentiles. I said it twice earlier, but here I'm proving it to you from the Bible, that the Bible says it, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. So this is, a, it's written somewhere else, that all Israel shall be saved. Please underscore it. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, and remember, Jacob is Israel. His name was changed to Israel. This is my covenant unto them. This is my covenant. This is what is written.
that this is God's covenant to them. So concerning the, the gospel, which is of Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ, they are enemies of the gospel right now for our sake so that we can come in. But remember, it says here in verse 28 of Romans 11, they are beloved for the Father's sake. They are beloved. They are God's beloved. Listen to this. We use this scripture, Romans 11, 29, sometimes for our own interpretation and benefit. And that's okay. That's what the word of God is for. It's, it's applicable to every situation. But this scripture in verse 29 was used specifically for this situation. It's the precedence given for the situation of the Israelites where it says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. In other words, when he called Abraham, when he gifted Abraham and his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and those 12 sons, when he gifted them with salvation, when he called them with his covenant, it was forever. It's without repentance. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. For as you in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. So we had a, you who are Christians, there was a time when you didn't believe. There was a time when I didn't believe. Right now, there are many who don't believe. But God's mercy shone through. And even so, the Bible says in Romans 11.31, these Israelites also who do not now believe through mercy, through, and please underscore this, through our mercy, they also may obtain mercy. And the point I'm coming to now, I says we need to pray for our families. We need to pray for our friends. But here, I'm going to add, we need to pray for Israel. That our mercy extended to them may also lead to their obtaining mercy. Because God did not conclude them all in unbelief. That he might it wasn't the end. Their unbelief wasn't the end. Their unbelief led to our salvation. And it says, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So don't let's be so self-righteous so high and mighty and arrogant in our own conceits, in our own ideas and opinions that we have no idea about. God wants you to be educated today on who Israel is to him. They're his firstborn, his beloved, how he feels about them. They will be saved. How he feels about us concerning them. We're attached to them, to their roots. We're attached to Israel's roots. We, the branches, are grafted in to Israel's roots. So when we lift our hands up against Israel, guess who else we're lifting our hands up against? Not only God, who did it this way, his way. We can't search out his judgments. We can't search out his ways. When we lift our hands against Israel, we're lifting our hands against ourselves because we're grafted in to the root of Israel. We need to pray for Israel that they might be saved. Let's go back 
to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And verse 1. Brethren, my desires, prayer, my Sorry, let me read that over again. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And this is the crux of the message today. That we as the church, the ones who grafted in to the root of God's firstborn, God's beloved Israel, so that we too become his beloved. God's heart is that our heart's desire, like Paul says here, our heart's desire and our prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. They have a zeal for God even now. If you look at the Sabbath day all over Israel, the Sabbath day is still holy to them. Many still observe the Sabbath day. If you look at the Wailing Wall in Israel, you'll see Jews all over that wall praying to the God of Israel. But the Bible says they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Because they didn't move to the place of salvation through Jesus Christ. And in doing so, they've established their own righteousness. And they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And that's a lot of us. But we're focusing today on the Jews that God is calling us to pray for. Our brothers and sisters, by blood, by the fact that they were grafted in to their roots. Verse 4 of Romans 10 says, For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. That's where the church came in. And that's where Israel is falling short on understanding that Christ, is the end. Christ is the end. He fulfilled the law. He is, that's why on the cross, when he stretched his hand out, just before he died, he said, it is finished. He fulfilled the law. And this is where the Jews stumble. Verse 8 of Romans 10 but what says it the word is nigh unto us even in our mouths and in our hearts that is the word of faith which we preach is this true about you is the word of God near to you even in your mouth and in your heart the word of faith it says, if you should confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is where we are as the church. This is where we need our families, our friends to be. And this is where God wants Israel to be. That they with their mouth will confess the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. And there's coming a day soon when all of them will see and understand and know. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believes on him, that's Jesus, Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12 of Romans 10. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. It's the same Lord over all who is rich unto all who call upon him. For whosoever, 
whosoever, whosoever, that's every human being in the entire world, whosoever, whether in Dubai or Canada or Guyana or London or Scotland or Africa or Brazil or Mexico, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, China, North Korea, Iran, Egypt, Libya, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But listen to this, verse 14 of Romans 10. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they, our family and friends, the Israelites, how shall they call on Jesus Christ in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And that's where we come in. We need to speak. We need to tell. How shall they hear without a preacher? And we're all preachers in this case. We're all witnesses of Christ. We're all bidden to go and tell. And we don't have to go outside of our country, outside of our city to tell. We tell by our lives to the very people who are around us what we believe. We tell with our words, our actions. How shall they preach except they be sent? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit when he tells you, open your mouth and speak? Or when he tells you, don't say anything? When he tells you, give something? When he tells you, smile? When he tells you, say certain words? You look beautiful today. Who knows, that person that you say, you look beautiful today, might be thinking, I'm nothing and going forward to kill themselves, and the words that you use shock them into reality, shock them back to life and back to hope. How shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall we preach except we be sent? The Holy Spirit sent us. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace. Ours is a gospel of peace. So when there's all that fighting and arguing about who's right about the Bible, who's right about Christianity, that's not the Holy Spirit. It's a gospel of peace. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We need to pray for Israel. We need to bless Israel. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless them that bless you. This is God speaking. He says to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Do you want to be cursed? Then don't curse Israel. Do you want to be blessed? Then you bless Israel. Start now by asking God to forgive you for all the things you've said about Israel without knowing the truth, all the lies you've believed about Israel without knowing the truth, and the things that have come out of your mouth as a result. Ask Him to forgive you and give you insight into his truth and cause your mouth not to speak. Ask him to put a watch the door of your mouth. And when people are speaking against Israel, don't join in. 
Deuteronomy 30, verse 7. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecute you. This is what he said to the children of Israel. All those who are your foes and your enemies who persecute you, I will put all the curses. Every curse you find in the Bible, I will put them on, on those enemies. Jeremiah 30, verse 20. Their children shall be as they were of old, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. I will punish all who oppress the Jews. As I come down to the end of the message, I want to go to Psalm 50, and I want you to take a look at God again. God, the God that we serve. In Psalm 50, and this is what God says, the mighty God, even the Lord has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down, therefore. God is the one who set and established this way where the Jews are his beloved, his firstborn, and where we, the church, are grafted in to the root of those that he established first. And we, that happens through Jesus, who himself was a Jew. He was the son of Judah, one of Jacob, who is Israel's son. And so we are of the line of the tribe of Judah. We're established. We're brought in to that root. It says in verse 2 of Psalm 50, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God has shined. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Have you made a covenant with God by sacrifice? Have you made a covenant with the living God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? If you've made that covenant with God through believing and receiving Jesus Christ, then you are a part of the ones that God is speaking to right now. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and remember in the Old Testament where it says Israel, now we can also see ourselves as the root of Israel. So he's also speaking to us. I will testify against you. I am God, even your God. And I'm going to go head on, and I'm going to go um, down to verse 21. He says, these things have you done. Look at verse 20 of Psalm 50. You sit and speak against your brother. You sit and speak against your brother. Verse 19 says, you give your mouth to evil and your tongue frame deceit. So it's showing us what God is against right now. He says, you've done all these things 
and I kept silent. So you think that because I kept silence that I was altogether such as one as you yourself. You think that because you speak bad about Israel and God didn't do anything about it, that he agrees with you. He says, but I will reprove you and set them in order before my eyes. Now consider this. You that forget God, you that don't understand that his truth is in his holy word, revealed by his Holy Spirit, that he sent to live with us who believe 24-7 for the very purpose of teaching us truth, of speaking truth to us, of guiding us in the truth. He says, you that forget God, consider lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver you. Who so offer praise glorifies me, and to him that orders his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Do we want to see the salvation of God? Then we need to order our conversation, not just our words out of our mouth, but our thoughts. And remember, our mouth speaks from what is the abundance of our, of our heart. And the abundance of our heart comes from the things we've been dwelling on. What have you been dwelling on? Who have you been dwelling under? Who have you been listening to? What are your thoughts about Israel? What are your thoughts about God? Remember what he says in verse 21 of Psalm 50. These things have you done. And I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether such a one as yourself. But I will reprove you. I will set them in order before your eyes. I don't want to be reproved and have things set in order before my eyes. And then it's too late for me. Where I've got to bow my knees anyways and confess that he's God. Just because things, listen. Just because things don't appear to be judged immediately doesn't mean that they're not being judged. It reminds me of Adam and Eve when they sinned against God and they knew they had sinned. They ran and hid. They covered themselves up with fig leaves. They covered themselves up with their own ideas, their own thoughts. When they sinned, look what it did. They didn't die immediately. They didn't die for years and years. But spiritually, they did. And physically, it's brought so much evil into the world. So just because sin abounds and nothing seems to be happening, there's an expiration date. Listen, there's an expiration date fast approaching. It reminds me of when Jesus cursed the fig, fig tree in Mark chapter 11. It says in verse 20, as they passed by the next day after he cursed the tree, they saw the tree had dried up from the roots. And then Peter remembered what the master had did. He cursed the tree. And Jesus said to him, have faith in God. And so I'm saying to you today, as I come down to the end of the message, have faith in the God of the universe. That his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we must get to the place where we begin to accept God as God and his ways as what is and what will be. So I want to end, come down to the end of the message to say to you, Israel, God says himself, is my son, even my firstborn. And I want to say to you, take heed. 
Take heed. First Timothy 4.16 says, Take heed unto yourselves and unto the doctrine, unto the truth, continue in them. For in doing so, you shall both save yourself and those who hear you. What are they hearing from you? Take heed. That word, take heed, is an echo. And it says, hold upon, retain, detain, pay attention, hold forth, mark, stay, take heed unto, give heed unto. Give heed. There's a second word for take heed in Hebrews 3.12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Take heed, blepo. And it says, behold, beware, look, perceive, regard, see. So I'm saying to you today, take heed what you believe. Have faith in God. Believe that he is God. God is God. And he will always be God. This God who loves us so much, who had a plan, people say, well, why didn't he just get rid of evil? If he got rid of evil, if he gets rid of evil right now, he takes away our choice. He takes away the choice for us to choose him or choose evil. Today, I ask you to take heed, to have faith in God, to pray not only that you will Receive the truths of God and walk in them. Continue to walk in them. But that you'll pray for those that you love around you. That they too, the blinders of the God of this world, will be removed from their hearts, from their minds, so that they too can receive the truths of God and come in to salvation. But I ask you also to pray for, to bless, and do not curse Israel. Let me end with this psalm. Psalm 122, verse 6. Psalm 122. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, and prosperity within your palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And that's what I want to encourage you today. Seek the good, not only of yourself, by choosing God over every decision that you make. Choose God. Every truth that you need to know is in the Word and will be revealed to you by His Holy Spirit. Seek the good not only of yourself and your loved ones, but seek the good of Israel, the good of God's firstborn, God's beloved, the Jews, Israel. Amen? God bless you today. Please do not be the ones who want to gather to where they hear what makes them feel good. That's not going to help us in the end, which is approaching soon, and which will approach for some sooner than others. That's not going to help. Lies are not going to help. God is truth. God is his word. His Holy Spirit is sent to us as a gift, a free gift, a promise to be with us 24-7 to teach us this word, 
to guide us into God's word, God's truth, to help us to overcome the evil one who's busy right now. Amen. God bless you, Brother Kingsley, Sister Holder. Bev, Aunt Evelyn, Joy, Norma, God bless you. Continue to seek God for your family. Continue to stand firm. Don't give up. God is truth. His word is truth. If he says it, it is so. Whether we believe it or not, let's choose to believe. Amen? I love you. Should he say the same? I will speak with you Sunday. Bye-bye and be blessed.